Well, today we are going to speak about moral perfection. And as we go, the first, let's see here. Now, there you are. Well, the topic perfection is not new. And Aristotle presents this oldest definition of perfection. He says the perfection, uh, it's something that is complete. That means it's contained all the requ requisite parts. And he's also said that something that is good, that is nothing of kind, could be better. That's the meaning of perfect for him. And also he said, it's something has attained its purpose. So to Ari Aristotle, Ar Aristotle, perfect mean, meant complete. Nothing to add, nothing to subtract. subtract. As we move forward in the time, we have René Descartes. And René Descartes, the concept of perfection as an attribute to, of God entered the theological um, purview only in modern times thanks to René Descartes. And in the plural, as the perfections of God. So that was the first time we have we heard about perfections of God with word thank you to uh, René Descartes. Just a little bit history about the word perfection. Now I have a story to tell you. It's a Zen story. Uh, it's a story of a disciple of a great Indian guru who asked the great master, how many lives I live to achieve perfection. He's very curious, say, Ma Master, how many lives I have to live until I achieve perfection? Well, the master, the master pointed to the great tree under which he was sitting and replied, you must live as many lives as there are leaves on this tree. So imagine the disciple face when they look at the tree and the tree in that is so many leaves over there. You can see like securely that is a, there are thousands of leaves, right? But see what happened with the disciple. Uncle hearing this answer, the disciple began sobbing uncontrollably. When the master asked him why he was crying, he explained, oh, so few, so few to reach perfection. So he had the opposite, uh, I think, reaction, right? We would say, oh my God, so many lives I have to live to achieve. But the disciple said, no, this is so few, so few to reach perfection. So it seems at first that perfection is unattainable because it's linked to a number of leaves in the tree. But imagine how many thousand leaves, meaning thousands of lives, lives. However, perfection, it is feasible because we are immortal spirits. And if you are immortal spirits with an opportunity, endless, opportunity and each of existence to make it right. So if we don't get it right, another opportunity will come through another existence and so on. And as we go, we get closer to our relative perfection because we learn with our mistakes. Now, then come Jesus and Jesus will say to us, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. On his sixth, this is the sixth thing, uh, beatitude of sermon of the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus, according to evangelist Matthew, on the chapter 5, verse 8, brings us this teaching. Blessed are the pure in heart. So according to the Spirit's interpretation of this message, which is in the book, The Gospel According to Spiritism, Spirit of Heart is inseparable, inseparable from simplicity and humility. Let's reflect about the word heart in this message. So the pure, the pure heart comes with simplicity and humility. That's the message of Christ. But we're going to talk about now the word heart and what is the meaning uh, today and what was the meaning by then in the Bible. Well, definition of heart in today's world, the term heart is used mainly to describe the emotional aspect of the individual. The emotional or moral nature as distinguished from the intellectual nature. For, ex for example, if you say the, the sentence, he was all head and no heart. So a person who was behaving, he was all head and no heart, that means he acts without emotions. So we link the heart with the emotions. But there is a lot of meanings uh, heart, the word heart can give us. For instance, you can say a leader with heart. What is a leader with heart? That means compassion. You can say, for instance, he won her heart. He won her heart, that means love, affection in this case. Another example is she never lost heart. What does it mean? She never lost courage enthusiasm. So heart is always related to some kind of emotion that we carry on. Now, we can keep going on here, but the point is to show that the use of the word heart to describe, describe a myriad of emotions. Now, what we can see, um, what we can see next is the meaning uh, in the Bible in the Bible, the term heart describes every aspect of the inner person. It describes the whole self, the essence, this, the essence of personality. There is no more comprehensive word used in the Bible to describe every aspect of the function of the individual's mind, consciousness, or self. So that's very strong. We need to know that because heart has very meaningful meaning. And heart is the very, very center and source of all that we are and all that we do. Therefore, the state of the individual's heart is central to one's relationship to God. That's how heart is interpreted. So when you say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, you see the relation of these emotions, what that means, everything that we are individuals, mind, consciousness, consciousness, and self in relation to God. That's the, the, the word heart in the Bible. Now, we know quite well that we human beings, we can present in our hearts different emotions. Some of these emotions are bad. Some of the emotions are good. For instance, we can have from ill so thoughts and greed, slander and arrogance, but we can have also emotions of love, compassion, and fraternity. So when Jesus talks about pureness of heart, he's invited us to work on our inner transformation so that we can reach 
moral perfection. Now, so now we know we process the we possess the good and the bad things. So continue here. Let's continue in the message and the in the message bring, brought by Jesus. He says. Again, on his sixth beatitude of the Sermon of the Mount of Jesus, according to Evangelist Matthew, on chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, brings up, let the little children come to To such as this. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So let's see why, why Jesus is referring to children. Let's understand this. Jesus does not say that kingdom of God is for them literally. He didn't say only children will reach the kingdom of God. That's not the message. He says for those who are like them, who are like children. So let's understand why. why. So when he says, let the children come to me, this comparison, if you if you read that first, doesn't seem right because we know that spirit of a child may be quite old and upon being reborn to corporeal life, it brings with it the imperfections that had not gotten rid of in its previous existence. So we know that a child it's a spirit, it's a mortal spirit with many, many experiences back then, back then. So only a spirit who has reached perfection could give us a model of two spirit. But you see, if you think only this life, if this the comparison that Jesus is doing with children is precise, if you think only about the present life. Why? Because having not yet manifested in perverse inclinations, little children offer us the picture of an innocent and candor. Continue there. In the gospel according to Spiritism, we have these questions on um, is the chapter... Eight, yeah, item second, there is a question there. Since the spirit of a child has already lived before, why does not show from birth what it really is? So the spirit wants to clarify, clarify to us why the child being an old soul does not show any of the imperfections right away, right? And there is a very, very good explanation there that you can read the whole text, which is very important. But what we bring here for you, that's what it inter that, is, that is related to our uh, study today. Children have need of sensitive care, which only a mother's tenderness can give them. And this tenderness increases with their frailty and innocence. So that's the child that requires from us to give them love, to take care of them. That's our duty, not always happen, but that's not the case here. So to a mother, her child is always an angel and it must be that way in order to capture her concern. She would not have the same care toward her child if instead of innocent charm, she found behind her child's infantile feature a viral character and adult thoughts. 
and she would care even less if she knew about the child's past, because that's what happened, right? Family is a way we practice love. For those we have family, we have kids, we have relationships, and those relationships means we have to practice love. It doesn't matter if those who are family now were respons responsible for suffering in the past, or we were the responsible one, right? So everything is wise in God's work. So that's, we need to understand that. And that's why Jesus compares us with children because of the innocence and the pureness of heart. Now, I have some questions here. Do we, you may, um, going to see, those are irrelevant. But if you give importance for, for the spiritual aspect of life, those questions are fundamentals. fundamentals. So the first question, one of the most important questions that we can ask is, how can we be truly pure in our hearts? How can we achieve that? How can we be pure in our imaginations, in our thoughts, in our words, in our decision-making, and in our desires? Because it's, be pure of heart it doesn't mean only actions. It means everything. The individual as a whole, that means our thoughts, imaginations, what we think, decisions we make, and our desires. Another question may arise. How can we think what God thinks, will what God wills, and desire what God desires, and love what God loves? How can our hearts be pure hearts, free from errors, like pride and envy, free from evil thoughts and evil deeds. How do we do that? So, on the journey to look for the answer to those fundamental questions, we may, we may do things and behave in certain way that's not going to help us to find the right path. What I'm talking about is this. Many people, many people have tried to purify themselves through actions of physical asceticism or leading a life of complete self-denial. What is asceticism? Asceticism is a severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Now, or some people would do, or we are going to do, maybe in past existence or even this one, by methods such as going away from the world and living in solitude, or living in permanent silence, or beating their bodies with whips and clubs or try to cleanse those themselves through celibacy, fasting, and prayers. So the, the teachings of Spiritism that brings us is this. Such behavior will not result in purity of heart. That's not it. That's not what Jesus is talking about for us. The path to pureness of a heart, let me read this paragraph. The, the path to a pure heart begins with the realization 
that we are on the way to perfection and therefore we still harbor negative feelings in our heart. So first, we need to acknowledge that. And it's a process. You see this picture, it's metaphorically, it's a stairs. It lies going up in a stairs. You're working on those negative, those flaws that we have. So working on our flaws, we learn from the teachings of Jesus and from the Bible that the way to God has nothing, nothing to do with our external appearance or our behavior or our achievements. It does not matter what level of education, intellect, business success, or social position the person has achieved. That's not what we're talking about. These factors have no effect on pureness of heart. So what it does, before to get there, I wanted to go through this parable. This parable is one of the Jesus parables. We get a parable, almost, uh, this, let's just say the second part. We're not going to talk the part that the king sends his servants to find people to come to the wedding, have all these difficulties to find people to come. We get to the part, then there are people already there on the table to participate the feast, the banquet uh, for this wedding. Okay, so let's read the parable. Uh, the servants, after having invited and gathered together all those, both good and bad, whom they met in the streets, to sit at the tables and fill up the wedding hall, saw the king enter and ask a man. There was a man on the table. And the king asked him, my friend, why have you come in without a wedding garment? The men remained silent. Then the king told his servants, bind his hands and feet and cast him into outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and garnish, garnishing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. You can see this uh, parable in the book, A Gospel According to Spiritism, chapter 18, item 2. Very well. So we learn from this parable that it's not enough simply to be invited. It's not enough simply to take the name of Christian, nor to sit at the table to take part in a heavenly banquet, because it's a metaphor, the banquet. Before anything else, as an express condition, it is necessary to be dressed in a wedding garment. What is this? Means This means to have a pure heart, and to press the law according to its spirit. So this parable um, say to us that the pure of heart represented by the one wearing a wedding garment is the, is the pureness of heart. When we dispose all the flaws that we have in our heart, so we're ready to sit at this heavenly banquet. That's one uh, beautiful passage that we have. Now, in the Spirit's book, 
if you go to the question 919, the spirit, the Allan Kardec asked for the spirits. What is the most effect means for improving ourselves in this life and for resisting the draw of evil? Well, Kardec was looking for perfection as well. And he asked a very, very serious question. And look at the answer. A sage of antiquity has told you, know thyself. thyself. So the self-knowledge, the courage to, say, to, to face our flaws is the key to have a spirit in our heart. Continue on the spirits book, we go to the question 909. Alain Kardec asked the following question. Could humans always overcome their evil tendencies through their own efforts? Well, in other words, what Kardec is trying to do? It's up to us to eliminate the bad tendencies we have. It's up to us. Kardec wants to know. And the spirits, the benevolent spirit says, as a rule, we are very quick to excuse transgressions. I'm sorry, what is the answer? Yes, and sometimes with very... Look at the, the answer. Yes, and sometimes with very little effort, what they la lack, hey, it means us, is willpower. How few of you make such an effort, however, only few of us make a, this effort because it requires an effort, right? So what happened to us is, as a rule, we are very quick to excuse Transgressions, I think we all can see in this example, making all sorts of rationalization in order to justify our thoughts and actions. We know that we're doing what wrong, but we deny it to ourselves. That's the bottom line. So until we recognize the complete inadequacy of dealing with our imperfections through the use of halfway measures, we cannot hope to overcome them. We need to face straight. And if you are serious about personal change, if you are really, really committed, we must not hang on to any known imperfections we have. Once we you know, identify some flaws that we have if you, have, if you are envy, if I'm anger all the time. We need to find the, the root of this and try to fix it. So keeping our hearts pure will require a total comm commitment at every moment. It's not just... Um, when I go to the Spirit Center and I listen to a lecture, it's not only that, or when I pray, it's every moment as we go through our day. So we must commit ourselves every day to at least make the attempt not to make mistakes at all, right? But at least we are try. we are making the attempt. All right. So I'm going to bring this figure very well known in the United States culture, Benjamin Franklin. He has a bio autobiography. In this autobiography, Franklin, he listed his 13 virtues. So Benjamin Franklin wanted to achieve moral perfection. So the purpose of uh, Franklin's list of virtues was to separate the right 
or wrong by delineating boundaries around everyday activities. It's very interesting to read all of that. So that people could avoid unhealthy trains of thoughts. So he listed a lot of daily activities and say, hey, do this so you can avoid, you know, go to the wrong way of thoughts. So from his own experience, Franklin passed on an important lesson when he said that, that's important to our study today. He said this, the following, contrary habits, contrary habits must be broken and good ones acquired and established before we can have any dependency on a steady, uniform rectitude of conduct. So morality was a way of behaving that resulted in a balanced life composed of the best of all possible human experiences. That's the message uh, brought by Benjamin Franklin, and I think it was very uh, related to, to our study today. Now, do you know the three R's of spiritism? I think you know. I believe you know. So let's go over them, each one of them. The first one is repentance. To achieve a pure heart, first and foremost, we have to regret. So repentance is related to a heart period because it is an inward, sincere state of the heart or mind that sees the exceeding wrongness of an error committed is when you is when you and after the reparation comes comes the renewal so the repentance in me is when i recognize the wrongdoing and i realize i have to do something with this. This something is reparation. And this phase of reparation, we must willing to make amends. May you say you're sorry for what have, you have done to the person. Maybe you, you take some, you know, good action towards a situation that you is, is, is in your hands to fix it, right? So, and so we must be willing to make amends and to repair the errors we have committed. It requires courage to face the consequences of our actions and to admit them publicly whenever necessary. So you see the boy there, I will make amends. Now, we see constantly on the news, people, they are making reparation nowadays because not they, they didn't repentance without an accusation. They were accused. When they see there is no way out, maybe a repentance will come out sincerely, sincerely maybe. And I hope it, it is sincerely. And then the people can make a reparation, and then the third phase is the renewal. What is the renewal? If we follow the inspiration of our hearts and fulfill the needs of our hearts, we will reach the third stage, which is to find ourselves completely renewed in a process of re re regeneration. That's when we start to heal from all those, those flaws that we have. Then when we start to, to make our way to have our um, pure heart. Well, if you are not tired, 
I'd like to recommend to you this book. It's called oh, Living Spring. And Living Spring is a book by Chico Xavier with from the psychographic uh, The Spirit Emmanuel. And there is this item, one, 100 for one, that it says, renew yourself always. He always ask permission for you to read it. And this book, they always, um, Emmanuel makes comments of passages from the Bible. And this one is from Paul of Tarsus and the second letter to Corinthians, which is chapter 4, verse 16. Paul said, even though our outward man is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed day by day. Hear what Emmanuel say about this passage. Each day has a lesson for us. Each experience leaves behind its corresponding value. Each problem entails a determined objective. So there are those who tormented by counterproductive fears express their rebe rebellionness when faced with infirmity, poverty, delusion, delusionment, or old age. So people get desperate when they are sick, when they're facing very hardship, financial hardship, when they are getting old. Now, in the scene of daily struggle, there is no lack, lack of those who spectacularly flee their responsibilities, seeking in their, in their discontinuance of the good fight and their gradual agreement with death, peace, which they cannot find. So unfortunately, some of us, our brothers and sisters, And Emmanuel continues, remember that civilizations have come and gone for thousands of years, and that human beings, no matter how happy and powerful they might be, have had to lose their vehicle of flesh to settle their moral accounts of with eternity. What's Emmanuel saying here? It doesn't matter how happy or powerful we are, we have at the moment, we're going to face a disincarnation. We're, gonna, we're going to pass away. And when we pass away, as we know as spiritists, the life continues, we'll be facing our conscience. That's what we'll be facing our consciousness. Now, Emmanuel continues, even when the trial seems invincible or when pain shows itself insuperable, do not withdraw yourself from the position of a fighter in which divine providence has placed you. Remember that tomorrow the day will return to your arena of work. Stand firm in your area of service, teaching your mind to accept God's will. Resignation here, right? Sickness may only be a temporary and health summons handed down by heavenly justice. A scarcity of earthly resources is always an educational obstacle. A disappointment received with fervent courage is a work of Lord's choosing on our behalf. The aging of the physical body 
is the solidification of wisdom for eternal happiness. Be optimist and diligent in the good amidst confidence and joy. For while the envelope of flesh gradually wastes away, the imperishable soul renews itself moment by moment for life everlasting. This is a very, very beautiful message by Emmanuel in this book. And I want to end our talk today with this letter from Paul to Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. It is no longer I that live, but it's, it is Christ that is living in union with me. So this letter of Paul leads us to a wide and necessary reflection on the marks of Christ in the ethical, moral, and spiritual sense in our lives. Thank you so much, and may Jesus bless us all. Thank you. 